Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freider, Consultants in Clinical Neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. I'm sorry it's been a while since I've actually produced a video, uh, but it's just been super busy at work. In this video, I'm going to be talking about photosensitive epilepsy and trying to gain more of an understanding as to why it's so difficult to understand, but also knowing what we do know about it, how we can try and take steps to mitigate uh, some of the risks associated. So first of all, what is photosensitive epilepsy? This is a susceptibility to seizures triggered by light. Now they may be very specific types of light in certain types of ways, but it may also be in very specific circumstances, and we will talk a little bit more about that later on. It's classed as a reflex epilepsy because uh, very commonly um, it is associated in a very reproducible way between the actual flashes of light and seizure onset. So because of this reliable relationship between the two, it's often classed as a reflex epilepsy. Now, in terms of epidemiology, it tends to affect more women than men in a ratio of about two to one. It affects about one in 4,000 or so of the general population, and it may be a fam familial or genetic trait, um, and it can affect somewhere between 10 and 20 or so percent. In terms of our fundamental understanding of this, it's actually a huge conundrum because our usual model of epilepsy involves an area of the brain where things are going wrong electrically. There's an initiation area where abnormal um, synchronization of electrical activity is occurring. So the neurons are firing synchronously out of the usual controls uh, which would in inhibit or, or guide their pathway through the brain. And that may be due to overactivation of those neurons or perhaps decreased inhibition. So um, the mechanisms which can dampen down some of these types of events may not be working correctly. And so we usually have an initiation area. And then from that zone, it propagates outwards across a particular network or networks. And so we would generally expect um, for a photic epilepsy to actually usually arise from the, the area of the brain which is usually associated with processing that information, the visual cortex. And so we would expect it to occur in situations where there's an anatomical disruption or you know, various lesions in the back end of the brain where this occurs in the primary visual area. But in fact that often is not the case, uh, although sometimes it is the case, but usually it isn't the case. In fact, if we look at um, the epilepsies um, overall, those who have epilepsy, about 5% will be photosensitive, and the majority will actually be in relation to the genetic generalized epilepsies. So those are epilepsies where huge networks of the brain are being activated, particularly in those who were affected by juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, uh, which um, about two thirds of patients will be light sensitive. And also as well, uh, usually the, the cause as to why it tends to manifest itself in the peripubertal years because of the association with those particular types of epilepsies. Now it can occur in focal epilepsies, but those uh, are usually less common. It will usually, when that does happen, occur to those where they have occipital epilepsies, but sometimes it can also occur in those who have pure temporal lobe epilepsies too. And so we can start to understand that the mechanisms um, involved can be quite complex. They can be quite different between those who are affected. And overall, most people would um, agree that it's actually quite a heterogeneous uh, mixture of different causes all coming out with this um, relationship between light triggering and seizures uh, occurring. Now, I don't normally get involved with showing EEGs on this channel, but I just wanted to highlight some of the complexities and just sort of bring it to life and show you um, just how the networks um, can be synchronized. So first of all, we have over here on the right hand side, a standard EEG recording machine. Um, it has a computer, it's got a head box where all the wires that we put onto the head are attached into. And on top we have got a strobe, a light strobe, which actually gives these pulses of light. And uh, pretty much every EEG machine you'll see advertised will, will have that light strobe with it. Now, the way we put the uh, electrodes on the head, again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, we put them in very specific ways, and then we can basically daisy chain 
um, how we record the electrical activity in very standard ways. What I'm showing here is what we call the double banana or the bipolar longitudinal montage. And basically what we have are chains of electrodes covering um, from front to back um, across the uh, what we call the frontotemporal chains and centroparietal chains uh, on the towards the inner uh, part and then the midline uh, chains and so uh, for the purposes of this I've actually highlighted the right hand side of the brain um, in with red and the left hand side of the brain in blue and down the center is in black so this is a normal EEG um, this is what we call the alpha rhythm and basically the the reds are here on the right side of the brain on the outer chain first then the um, outer chain on the left hand side then the inner chains on the right then the left and then the midline um, and that's the double banana and basically we can we can count over here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten about ten ten and a half hertz so ten and a half um, cycles per second um, so that's a very normal uh, alpha frequency and just bear that in mind when I show you the next slide so the next one I'm going to show you is when we apply 17 flickers per second and you can see at the back end of the brain both sides mainly on the left hand side uh, you can see these uh, spike slow waves over here and that's very understandable in terms of how these are being generated how these seizures can be generated if the uh, area the region of the brain which is dealing with vision is sending off these epileptiform discharges however although that's very understandable it's actually quite rare that we get to see that most of the time we we'll see generalized discharges in this particular scenario at 18 flickers per second we see these generalized poly spikes um, over here and in this second example i'm showing you at 8 hertz, at 8 flickers per second, we are seeing generalized spike slow wave discharges. And, you know, how, how do we get from those occipital regions to these very rapid onset generalized um, um, discharges, which imply quite widely distributed networks that the signals in this particular uh, set of examples are, are happening at a point where they can be widely distributed rather than perhaps originating simply at the back of the brain as would be very neat in terms of its understanding. And in fact, here's another type of pattern that we can see. In this particular case at 16 hertz, 16 flashes per second, we have at the front of the brain, the frontal regions, you see these polyspikes, which then move into these spike slow waves and if you look very carefully as well, you can see actually they spread from front down to back as they uh, begin to generalize. And so how do we get from the front end of the brain when it's all being processed at the back? And to begin to understand the complexities of this, let's delve a little bit into vision and how that works. Now, I know many of my viewers will be um, real aficionados of anatomy. Um, and so I'm always quite careful, uh, quite a discerning group that you all wonderfully are um, in terms of you know the accuracy of what I'm showing you and so I just broadly speaking wanted to highlight the following most of us will be well aware that we don't really see with our eyeballs um, those simply encode the photons of light such that they can be sent to the back of the end of the brain through quite a long pathway to where they can be processed so the primary visual area is called v1 uh, and then it's got some associated regions around all of that and then it begins to get sent um, to other parts of the brain so those signals get sent to the temporal region so we can um, understand what we are seeing is there an emotional content to what we're seeing we're of course creatures of the daytime uh, our vision is very important to us and what we do we need to understand what we are seeing is there any danger involved is it something we should be running away from is it something we should be running to the parietal regions are another very important area where the signals get sent up on towards the the upper part of the brain in the back and over here we start to understand where objects are in space we also have to send and encode that information to more frontal uh, parts of the brain, not only to um, the frontal eye fields um, and to the prefrontal cortex, where we 
um, you know, can understand or, or our brain can control where the muscle movements of the eyes will be taking our gaze next, uh, but also where we can start making judgments with what to do with this information and how we can then process that into actual generalized muscle movements. And of course, there are also, for the more discerning viewers, even some bypass circuits as well around the brainstem too. And the short of this is that there are lots of regions involved with processing visual information, there are lots of networks, there are lots of switches, and because of that there's lots of potential for things to go wrong. And I think that that really um, sums up best our understanding of why these photic epilepsies are just so complex. Vision is such an integral part of our brain, it's processed in so many different areas, and there's just a lot of capacity for things to go wrong. In fact, if we look at the relationship between those who've got um, these uh, paroxysmal discharges on the EEG and the circumstances of the seizures, we will actually discover that only about 40% of those where we actually see these discharges, these paroxysmal uh, spike waves, only about 40% will have pure photic induced seizures without any other seizures, and about 40% have got spontaneous and photic induced seizures and 20% have got spontaneous seizures only and won't actually manifest uh, in real day life with um, photic um, induced epilepsies even though we may see some discharges on the um, EEG when we do it in the lab and that just highlights further more that it's not uh, simply um, an, an epilepsy relating to vision at all. And in fact the majority of seizure manifestations will actually be generalized seizure manifestations, generalized tonic-clonic, absence seizures, myoclonic jerking, combinations of the above, and it's only really in a minority where um, they will actually be very much occipitally based, whether it's visual deficits or hallucinations, particular colors and so on, things coming into the uh, visual um, perception as it were. Sometimes of course these may secondarily generalize but overall the majority of seizure manifestations are in fact generalized. And so to summarize um, and to really recognize why we have all these uncertainties, vision is incredibly complex, lots of parts of the brain are involved and many networks and switches are activated and it's almost certain that there are different mechanisms, different pathways uh, which are triggered in different individuals, different groups. So having talked about the uncertainties, talked about the complexities, let's talk about induction. What, what, what types of light do this, uh, you know, what, what's, you know, what the triggers here? So we know that physical flashing of light is certainly a trigger. Um, under about four flickers per second, four hertz, it's actually incredibly rare for photic epilepsies to occur, um, less than 5%. Um, the most common flicker frequencies are between about 14 and 25, 30 hertz, really, uh, depending on the literature which you look at. And that's actually quite important when you understand how people used to quite commonly get them with the old um, cathode ray tube uh, televisions, where if you've got a 50 or 60 hertz um, refresh rate and it's interlacing then actually the um, perception of of the uh, page in front of you the screen in front of you would be respectively uh, 25 or 30 Hertz so certainly within the range of inducing um, photic um, epilepsies the um, potential for types of flash to um, induce a seizure is actually increased when certain patterns are involved um, or certain types of intensities. So the brighter the light is, the greater the contrast between light and dark, the relative size of the light source, even the color. So red is commonly um, more uh, epileptogenic than a blue or white light. And of course, the duration for how long this is going on for. There may be other aspects as well. For example, instead of a light being actively flashed, it can also be related to eyelid closure or blinking, and there's certainly um, an overlap with those who have flash-induced. 
And finally, context. Now, one of the most classic examples of context is actually video game seizures, where if you take people into the lab, only about 70% will actually have a demonstrable paroxysmal uh, responses in the laboratory. And 30% will escape detection with our strobes. And so what is it about video game epilepsy um, that um, you know, you, we may capture it or, or perhaps not capture it in the labs and that can actually very much relate to context what what are you seeing what's the emotional content when 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 kids are playing with the video games in fact the majority of um, people who are affected with video game epilepsy it's not the girls it's actually boys the ratio between boys and girls switches so the majority are, are boys and that's probably related to the fact that it's boys who are playing video games but when people play video games it's often for a long period of time there's emotional content involved um, with that um, because you know I don't know if you're playing a fighting game or something like that there's stress um, or you know playing in you know competitive type of way um, so there can be stress with that there can be sleep deprivation if people are, are, are you know going straight uh, straight through into the evenings late at night playing as well um, so there are various factors which may um, you know contribute to that so context can sometimes be very very potent in terms of activating a susceptibility to a um, photic epilepsy. So what's the emotional content? Is there any stress, any sleep deprivation? And also, um, you know, for certain circumstances, there may be alcohol involved as well. And so um, understanding the advice is, is actually pretty simple now, hopefully. Um, Obviously, we want to try and avoid triggers for these flashes, but that's not always possible. And so the idea is to try and reduce the overall load on the visual networks. So if you have less light coming into the visual system, then actually the stimulus for the seizures to be occurring is actually reduced. So part of the important advice is not to sit too close to the light source. So uh, with TVs, you know, there's commonly people are, are recommended to stay away from a meter um, and move two, three, four, five meters back, you know, whatever it takes. Sit away from the light source, it dilutes it down or, or away from a screen. Don't look directly at the light because the but the more that we look directly full onto the light, the more light falls onto the retina, into that central portion, and then gets actively processed um, through larger parts of the visual pathways, as opposed to when we see light coming in from the peripheries. Sometimes it can actually be quite helpful to close an eye with a hand. It doesn't help to close it with your eyelid, because actually all that's going to be happening is it will diffuse the light a little bit, uh, but actually it won't, won't be a, a, a proper... Um, reduction in the amount of light coming in and in fact in certain circumstances sometimes people do get given blindfolds if, if they are made aware that at a certain point in a the show um, then um, you know there might be some 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 strobes coming along so sometimes people can can mitigate in that way um, reducing associated factors is very important so uh, alcohol certainly recreational drugs which is very important in terms of when we talk about nightclubs um, sleep deprivation again stress excitement um, you know reducing any of those exacerbating factors will also be very helpful i'm now going to talk about nightclubbing i'm not going to be suggesting that people should be going to nightclubs if they have epilepsy but i think there is a reality to life which is there will be young people who do wish to go to nightclubs and it's important that those venues do try and make accommodations to try and avoid people having an epileptic seizure. At the end of the day, it's no fun for the person who's affected. It's no fun for the nightclub concerned when you know ambulances, etc., security have to be called in to, uh, to, to deal with the situation. So it's best off going, if you are going to have to go to a nightclub, to go to a licensed and regulated venue. The next point is, is HSC advice, health and safety executive, we always make jokes about them, but, but actually health and safety executive advice, you know, are, is that advice being followed? Now my understanding is, is at the moment it's not uh, the, the letter of the law that venues have to do this, but there is advice that they do promote to um, you know, help allow people with uh, light sensitive epilepsies to attend venues or to try and prevent them from happening because quite often uh, this may actually be the very first presentation of it and that is that the light should be going to less than four hertz 
and they should be synchronized lights if they have to have them at all. So by synchronizing them, it means that if you've got three lights next to each other and each of them going at slightly different uh, times, all at four hertz, you can actually end up effectively having 12 hertz, which is quite a potent activator um, of um, these type of epilepsy. So um, it's important that they all fly, fire off at exactly the same time and they're daisy chained in uh, to do that. Um, it's also helpful to have high ceilings, that way the light is diffused as it comes down, and they should be away from walkways or stairs so that people shouldn't have an accident in a tight spot or in a dangerous um, area. So I would suggest that if you are planning to go to a nightclub, check in advance, are strobes being used? Could they be avoided? Can they make that accommodation for you? If they can't make that accommodation for you, maybe think about going to a different venue where they do care about you, where they do care about your custom. It's also important to avoid exacerbators, alcohol, recreational drugs. It's particularly important this time of year towards the summer when I'm recording this, people going to festivals, um, sleep deprivation, hydration, you know, all very important factors to try and um, reduce the chances of having um, a heightened sensitivity to these um, uh, seizures. And of course, take a friend. Tell someone, if you know that you have this type of an epilepsy, tell a friend, take a friend with you, just make sure they're around, help you get out of trouble if that is the case. Now, if um, you know people are um, feeling um, that they are about to develop um, a seizure. There are certain steps that, that can be taken um, as emergency steps. Um, and so, um, you know, looking down, keeping your eyes away from the light source, covering your eyes up, one eye up in particular, will help to reduce that, um, that burden on those networks and still be able to make your way out with a friend. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be trying to, to, to run off um, and then you know find yourself down a stairway that wouldn't be good so make sure you're always with somebody let someone know um, if you are aware of it and avoid exacerbating factors so i'm not suggesting that you do go to nightclubs but you know do make sure if you are planning on going to them that they do accommodate for you and uh, relevant mitigation steps are enacted um, i hope that um, you've all found that useful please do stay safe um, there are so many uh, interesting facets to uh, light um, induced epilepsy i just can't go into uh, in one video um, but i hope that does shed some light as it were um, on this very important type of uh, trigger for certain types of of, of patient groups uh, with this uh, type of epilepsy and looking forward to seeing you in the next video as soon as i can record it all the very best